This week, we're reading The Winner's Curse by Marie Rutkowski, otherwise known as You're Either Gonna Fight or You're Gonna Fuck. Hi, readers. I'm Jordan. And I'm Katie. And welcome to Not Another Heroine Season 2, the podcast where we break down the best and worst fictional heroines of any genre. (laughs) Because that's what we do now. Want to see what's next on our TBR list? Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Instagram for a sneak peek at upcoming content or to help us pick our next book. I'm so excited. <laughs> we, yeah. I haven't been this excited over a book or a series of books in years. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like this better than Crown Duel. I agree. This has become my favorite pod book that we have reviewed. Dang. Like, hands down. Yeah. And not just favorite like book, favorite, all three books. Dang. Okay. <laughs> but I, I get it, though, because I feel like Crown Duel walked so that The Winner's Curse could run. That's a very nice way to oh, put it. You. I have moments of, you know, mental clarity. <laughs> <laughs> moments. <laughs> they are not. <laughs> so I guess as a warning to our dear sweet readers is we are obsessed with this series and we are doing all of the episodes like as many episodes as it takes to get through all three books we're doing them yeah i don't care yeah if you get bored go find another (laughs) podcast 10 episodes later (laughs) we'll we'll try to keep our episodes within our normal time frame Mm -hmm. um and skim through some of the more detailed political stuff maybe yeah but like there is so much to unpack here Mm -hmm. it is Thank you, by the way, for doing the pick of the week and getting this all started. I'm just glad that I was going through my Kindle library and I picked this and not some like trash the other because <laughs> it was really a 50-50. <laughs> yeah. There's some like banger quotes in here too. Like I know. I highlighted a fuck ton of stuff in I here. did too. Like I had to, you made one of the notes in our kind of general notes thing, but I think the best thing about this book is that the magic happens in these dialogue moments, in these like soliloquy, whatever moments where you're like, God damn. There's a <laughs> lot of like all of the characters, well, the two main characters, we have Aaron and we have Kestrel. They have so much introspection, yes. so much like reflection on their own actions and how it's impacting everyone around them. Like there's so many lessons that the reader gets through these characters. And it's just why can't every book be like this? I think it's because Aaron and Kestrel are smart. (laughs) You know what I mean, though? Because you read some books and you're like, God damn, girl, you're pretty, but you are not smart. No, (laughs) I will say, you know, I I love them together. Aaron is probably not my favorite hero. Something about him is not quite like, I'm sorry, Shivrayeth is my all time favorite hero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. Aaron works, but Kestrel, Kestrel is my hands down, no, no holds barred. He, she is the best heroine. She kind of reminds me of you. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You guys have very similar vibes, and you also play piano. I this is <laughs> oh, <laughs> I feel like I just paid you a, like a very good compliment, Thank and you. then I'm gonna say something kind of silly, but she's awkward, and I feel like you're a little bit awkward. <laughs> I'm more than a little bit awkward, <laughs> but like you guys are very similar. Huh. You know, got similar vibes going on. Well, and maybe that's the key to like why people like one book or another because there mm-hmm. is some like preference. Like you can have two very different books written intelligently but mm-hmm. differently, and whether a reader likes one or the other can come down to how much do you relate to the character. No, I could see that. I don't know that I really relate to Kestrel, but I have a lot of respect for Kestrel because mm-hmm. she makes these kind of very cold-hearted, calculated decisions that I'm like, God damn, I don't know that I could do that, but you go, girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's. I feel like you're closer to Mel. I could see that. Yeah. Which is like fight the good fight mm-hmm. for all the right reasons but, but you're a little bit like misunderstood <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. i'm like the big dopey like good-hearted but girl <laughs> let's bring you pull you back a little bit <laughs> oh well i mean thank you for that wonderful of course compliment because mm-hmm. yeah kestrel is the shit yeah honestly 100 percent. we stand kestrel here yeah. <laughs> um and so kestrel's gonna get all of her time for the next several weeks it's deserved. Because, mm-hmm. again, she's so smart. Because there are books that you read and you're like, okay, like, I can see the plot coming from miles away. But this keeps you kind of on the, the edge of your seat. The mystery that unfolds in book two, which we'll yeah. get into, like, you, you're you trying to put the pieces together along with Kestrel, but you're like, there, I, 
that's right on mm-hmm. the tip and you just don't know what's happening. And then on when the you, tip. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Pot, you were Katie. about to say something. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's <laughs> when you learn what happens, like what's going on in the background of book two, yeah. you're like, holy mother of God. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I, I love a martyr moment because the end of book one. Oh, when, my God. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> There is so many like who that is, I think, for both of us, like mar- like the heroine being a martyr for like not just to be a martyr, but like intelligently making the decision because that is the right decision. She and then just being standoffish about it and like hiding her heart. Of, of us. <laughs> this, is, this happens in all three books. Kestrel has these moments. Yes. And they're like game changers for the plot. Just read these fucking Just books. Read, <laughs> readers, and if you have read these books and you're as equally hot and bothered about like why people aren't talking about this as we are, yeah. I want to know. Just mm-hmm. tell us. And it's nice, too, because Libby has like eight copies of all of these books and nobody has checked them out, at least in my library, and I'm assuming at most libraries. So you can read them for free if you want, but uh, just pay Marie Rakowski her yeah. dues. You know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to buy these books. I only have them on my Kindle. Yeah. I need hard copies. Uh, did they do like a second release of the cover? Because the cover is very like 2014. It, yeah, um, I want to. I don't. I don't think it has. I it, they deserve it though. Do an ad campaign for this trilogy. Yeah, I want to make this book. Let's make this book great again. Um, have you seen those TikToks? No. Oh, <laughs> Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Cat vomit. <laughs> oh my god! I did hate myself a little bit by doing that. It's it's catchy though. I understand the the inclination. But have you seen those? The guy on Instagram who makes he's like a illustrator or something. He makes book covers and gives like a bunch of different options. They're beautiful. I'll send it to you. Oh. Um, or I'll put it on our story so everyone can see what I'm talking about. But we should like message him and be like hey this one because yeah. he doesn't do it for realsy but if the people are interested in buying it i think he does whatever but it needs a it needs a glow up a little bit it just yeah it is kind of you look at it you're like oh this is gonna be cheesy and it's like, not though it's not it's the it reminds me of um i forget the name of it i can picture the book it's like mm. a silvery blue white cover the girl in a ball gown with her back turned. the selection yes yep <laughs> thank you because i was thinking the same thing it's like that same set up style on the yeah. cover and like the, it's not i wouldn't be surprised if it came from the same publisher uh like Mac company or whatever something yeah the winner's curse is only rated 3.95 on goodreads fuck you reviewers <laughs> oh what? it was a nominee for best young adult fantasy science fi- it's not young adult 2014 and that's before Mac like why it was like dystopia what the fuck Goodreads is a hot mess. <laughs> Sorry, that was a rabbit hole. I'm getting caught and bothered again, Katie. <laughs> Sorry, Can't handle it. Let's just talk about this. Okay, let's yeah, let's get into it. Okay, so we will kind of defer our broader comments and general notes as they kind of come up throughout this book, and we'll just get into the synopsis. Mm-hmm. Where do we start? Maybe like an explanation of what's going on, because it kind of just throws you in from the beginning. Yeah, this is set in a. Romanesque mm-hmm. style land. It's an empire that is swallowing up other little kingdoms very effectively. Mm-hmm. The empire is Rome, if you think of it that way. Mm-hmm. And so our heroine lives in a like a conquered colony. So she is what's the name of the empire? Uh, Valoria. Valorian. So she's Valorian, and all Valorians are like these blonde, brown-eyed, kind of pale. Courage over everything. I'll fall on my own sword instead of disrespecting my nation. Courage, valor. It's kind (laughs) of like Vikings meets Romans. Yeah. That's that's the Valorian. Mm -hmm. Or Uh, not very smart, but very strong. (laughs) Exactly. Well, I mean, also very smart. Yeah. The because I think that was in part of the background is they were kind of looked as savages or like wild things, mm-hmm. but they kind of got it together and just destroyed everyone. They're smart militarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this conquered colony is named Heron. Mm-hmm. And one of the empire's trademarks is like as they conquer these colonies, they enslave the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, very much what like Rome did. And Kestrel, our heroine, is the daughter of the general Trajan. Trajan, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he was the general that conquered Heron. Mm-hmm. And he settled in Heron. And he's not the governor of the colony because he's a, like a military leader. But he is like very well respected. He is like one of the all powerful dudes. He's got a very close relationship with the emperor. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the setup. So he's gone a lot. They have their own courtyard 
Hayward Complex estate. And this is where Kestrel grows up. So she's kind of grows up in this colony. She's Valorian, but she's also kind of Heron. She speaks um, Heron mm-hmm. uh, very well, like mm-hmm. almost like a native. And uh, yeah, what did the mother tongue mother taught, taught or yeah. something? Yeah, she's raised by a heron slave mm-hmm. um, who becomes like a mother to her because mm-hmm. her own and mother. I, yeah, and not an a something. Yeah, and Kestrel's mother dies very cruelly and very mm-hmm. young. Yeah, we could talk about that backstory after the duel. Mm-hmm. There's like that moment of trust. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get to it. Keep it in your pocket. <laughs> so that is that is our setup for you know who is Kestrel? What, mm-hmm. What's her background? What land are we in? Like mm-hmm. um, magic isn't a huge. Like, magic isn't a thing. Mm -hmm. This is a made-up land. There's not, like, sorcerers or wizards. This is just a fictional empire. Mm -hmm. There is a little bit an aspect divinity if you're looking for it, because the Heron people have, like, a really robust kind of religious system almost. They have, like, a hundred god pantheon. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the Valorians, I think, are agnostic or... Atheist. Atheist, yeah. Yeah. They're like, there is no afterlife. Mm -hmm. Die for your country, because that's all you can die for. Yeah, because it's like your fate is in your own hands. Mm-hmm. and what a man does with a sword and et cetera, et cetera, masculinity. <laughs> a final note that I thought was w- very well done, but not like shove it in your face trying to send a feminist message mm-hmm. is that men and women join the military. Yeah. Uh, and equally, men and women can choose not to join the military and get married. Yeah. Which is kind of one of those like, you're either going to fight or you're going to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no other <laughs> options. Because <laughs> that's where we start with Kestrel too, is that um, her father is kind of like, Okay, you're getting close to 20. Well, she's only seven. She's, yeah. Okay. I'll, side side note. <laughs> Kestrel is technically 17 years There's old. There's no fucking way. There's no way. Like, for modern readers, this girl is probably 25 to 27. Yeah. Because she definitely, like, her frontal lobe is fully developed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Aaron's not so much. But no. Kestrel's, absolutely. Yeah. But that does track if we're looking at this is set in an ancient time. People are maturing mm-hmm. younger. Mm-hmm. That's, That's true. That could fit. Because, yeah. you know, her dad's probably in his mid 30s that's what i was thinking like 40s i general trajan is for sure hot (laughs) i need like a standalone novel of him having like a like a love story like like how he met his wife i I, no 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 wife is dead i want a new story (laughs) i dig it i dig it because he's like injured now he can't fight as much and like this is his new take on like i just love that he's super gruff but he has these like moments of this is my baby girl it's like oh <laughs> Maybe we'll write the fan fiction. <laughs> I'm on board. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Kestrel. Anyway, anyway, Kestrel. Uh, <laughs> please go. Uh, I don't even know what the first, like, what is the first scene? Oh, they're in the market. Yeah. Okay, so Kestrel, they're going through this market or whatever. Um, they're buying things. Her and Jess are society ladies. Jess is her best friend. Mm-hmm. They're kind of like walking around, and they kind of end up somehow at the slave market. Yeah, this is you know it's not a huge point but it's like the first glimmer that you get of Kestrel's character Mm -hmm. is that Jess is trying to buy earrings yeah and Kestrel she shows them to Kestrel and and Kestrel immediately looks at these earrings looks at Jess looks at like the Harani seller and it's like those are fake (laughs) (laughs) these are too pretty I I didn't add that in the summary, but I love that whole little story arc of mm-hmm. like the we'll we'll talk about it. It should be talked about. But like Kestrel's response to like looking at the Harani woman, like the seller, her panic when Kestrel calls her out, and mm-hmm. then Kestrel's like quick backpedal to like, oh, I don't I don't want to be an asshole. Like, oh no, just actually they're real. They're just exceptionally good, and thank you. And then then they proceed onto this like that. I- in short, is like Kestrel as a character. Yeah, because she has these moments of cold calculation at the beginning, but then I think that's her default mode. But then she has this empathy that comes in of like, my words, I just question this woman's like integrity, like she could be killed. Let me fucking find a way to backtrack on that. But she has this like cold calculation at first and then and then her empathy kicks in because she's originally like, these are fake. (laughs) That's it's so nice to see a character who's actually cold and calculating yeah. and like thinks 
but doesn't always like she remembers that she's human and, and like likes people and relates to people. But like like you said, her default mode is not that. Yeah. Oh, God. I'm glad that you like that scene, too, because I was like, this is kind of like a stupid detail, but it's like it's. It's a juicy detail. <laughs> it's a it's completely like that's how she interacts with Aaron the mm-hmm. entire course of the the trilogy. Yeah. She's like, "Oh, I'm going to do something cold and calculated and that is ultimately the right decision." Oh shit. Yeah. And it's interesting too cuz I wonder if that is kind of a byproduct of being raised by a general who's, you know, this storied war hero in a culture that focuses on, you know, like fate and making the right decision for the empire and like courage and stuff or is it just like who she is or just a combination maybe a little bit of both yeah it's fascinating i love gastro anyways they get to the slave market they get to the slave market <laughs> and they get kind of sucked into watching and just yeah. just wants to go there for some reason or, or another i think it's like they get sucked in by the crowd because like the auctioneer is like mm-hmm. uh, kind of a uh, st- I don't know the right word, but he, like, he makes things exciting. Yeah, he like scopes them out. Yeah, and, and then by the time that they kind of are getting closer, they they can't get back out. Yeah. Because you can feel their panic a little bit in the crowd of mm-hmm. like, I don't really want to watch these slaves get bought, but I can't back out. <laughs> and oh man. Yeah. So the auctioneer says like, hey, ladies and gentlemen, like I got a real treat for you. Mm-hmm. And he's like, he pulls out. Uh, this man who is he advertises him as like a former blacksmith and he's a singer and like Kestrel feels like she's kind of being eyeballed a little bit and it works because she kind of latches on to like the singing aspect Mm -hmm. Uh, because like you said Kestrel's a musician and she feels some sort of connection to the slave Mm -hmm. who is like we almost need to read that like the description of Aaron as he first comes out yeah. because like the summary of it is she immediately tells that he's not cowed like he has like an angry face uh, she calls it like determined or something mm-hmm. like I may be enslaved but I'm angry and I'm not going to go quietly like it's this like determination and of course he has you know gorgeous features <laughs> well that was fascinating because you don't get a description you don't get Kestrel's perspective of what Aaron looks like that is yeah you don't learn that Aaron's attractive until later that is true. from other people telling Kestrel like Oh, uh, you got a hot yeah. guy right there. Because she focuses on his like his eyes, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. it's very interesting. <laughs> this auctioneer ho- like hyper focuses on Kestrel, and then the crowd gets heated because they recognize her as General Trajan's daughter, mm-hmm. and she like for some reason unknown to her decides to bid on this slave. Mm-hmm. And when she bids, everyone else starts to bid, and then she's like, "I'm not losing. Like <laughs> this is mine." And so. The price goes up and up and up, and she ends up paying this ridiculous sum uh, to buy this slave. And this is kind of the whole premise of the title of this book, which Mm -hmm. you explained in the pick of the week. Mm -hmm. Because I think even an old lady kind of like starts laughing next to her and she's like, well, you kind of succumb to the winner's curse. And she's like, what are you talking about? But it's basically Kestrel has paid more for the slave than other people have deemed him worth. And so you won the auction, but in kind of whole you lost because you paid more than anyone else would have. And so the winner's curse. And it's funny because that kind of plays out the whole series (laughs) that you're paying more than people think it's worth. And if you read the acknowledgments, um, for this book, uh, the author kind of goes into how this was the inspiration for writing the story is like the winner's curse as a premise in 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 economics. Mm-hmm. And how does that translate when you apply it to people? <sighs> Ooh, what a brilliant fucking idea. I know. So <laughs> smart. <laughs> so she buys this. She buys this slave. His mm-hmm. name is Aaron. And she takes him home. Mm-hmm. And then she really doesn't know what to do with him. Yeah. <laughs> so she she like goes to the house steward and she's like, um, here he is. I'm going to leave now. Anyways, <laughs> I like it, too, because we don't know his name's Aaron until he, like, gifts it to her later. Because mm-hmm. they just call him Smith because he's a blacksmith. Mm-hmm. And then I think it's one of their first interactions that he realizes she's kind of, like, interesting. And she's like, oh, your name is obviously not Smith. He's like, yeah, it's Aaron. It's like, oh. <laughs> I will say I don't love Aaron as a name. No, no. Mm-mm. No. It needs something a little bit, like, you know. Maybe that's part of the like struggle with relating to Aaron and liking him as a hero. He's like, he doesn't really have like a hyper I can see that. masculine name. Yeah. That's fair. He needs, yeah, he needs something a little bit spicier, if that makes yeah. sense. You know? 
Um, yeah. But he basically just hangs out on vacation for the first like yeah. three or four days. <laughs> because no one knows what to do with him. And like everyone looks at Kestrel like, okay, this is the lady of the house. This is her guy. I'm not going to mess with him. And except the steward starts kind of fucking around a little yeah. bit. And he tells Smith to start making horseshoes. Got to test him out apparently with horseshoes. And like Smith is like, okay, uh, I can do that. And so he just makes a fuck ton of horseshoes. And he's like, this is like a nice vacation. And Kestrel checks in later and she kind of puts the pieces together and realizes, okay, so the steward is having him make tons of horseshoes. He's probably selling them for a profit. I love that interaction because like all of a sudden she's like, oh, I should probably see what the fuck, you know, this slave is doing that I bought. Yikes. And then she immediately is like, hey, uh, it's illegal for what you're doing. You're stealing from our estate. And then, you know, she sees the guy's reaction of like, oh, fuck, like I'm going to be you know, my hands cut off or something. And then she kind of backtracks and like, oh, well, uh, just let me, you know, have Aaron as my escort or et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But it's like that cold calculation of like, you're stealing from us. But oh, wait, fuck. That means that you're going to be, you know, fired and mm -hmm. <laughs> there's repercussions for what I just put together. <laughs> it's her analysis of all the situations she gets put in is so, is so good. It's so relatable. Mm-hmm. But eventually um, she decides to have Aaron be her escort because she's like a society lady, like you said, and she cannot like go off on her own. So she and her friend Jess or she goes to visit her friend Jess mm -hmm. and Aaron comes along um, and he's like standing in the background in the parlor while she and Jess have like like a private Gossip. <laughs> girl conversation. And like Kestel's kind of eyeing smith as he's eyeing them and she realizes that he understands way more valorian than like he's letting on mm -hmm. and so she banishes him from like the parlor she's like i need to go to the kitchen now because like i need to have some time with my girl yeah. and you're kind of messing with our vibe a little bit yeah and it's funny too because they're talking about so jess's older brother his name is ronan see that's a name that like, <laughs> they should flip, flip those names because yeah. ronan like ronan also needs his own yeah book honestly i'm not convinced he died Ah, spoiler. That's... Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I dig that because he he goes like, I okay. I I won't get into any yeah. detail because <laughs> fair, fair. there we go. Um, because it's fun because Jess starts making like kind of allusions towards Ronan asking Kestrel to marry him, and then that's when Kestrel's like, okay, Aaron, like go somewhere else, and it's like, oh, so even at the beginning, you're like uncomfortable. It's like that feeling when you know your crush is there, and then your other friend is talking about some other guy, and you're like, no, shut up, shut up. Yeah, and Kestrel's like not self aware enough about like understanding that kind of human interaction. Yeah. Like she doesn't understand like physical attraction mm -hmm. or like emotional stuff. Like she's kind of like remembers after the fact and yeah. then processes later. She's just kind of reacting. Yeah. She kind of strikes me almost as like a uh, demisexual mm -hmm. where you're kind of like everybody's just human until you develop like an actual relationship with them and you're like, oh, wait a second. Like, what are these feelings I'm feeling? Because mm -hmm. she's just so like calculating that I don't know that she necessarily like sees people as like romantic interest until she's like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> Can in fact relate. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, so there's a turning point where Kestrel kind of gets a sense that Aaron or Smith is more than he appears to be. Mm -hmm. And so they end up playing a game of bite and sting. Mm -hmm. And this, I think it's like a dominoes kind of style game. Yeah, I don't know what the equivalent is. Like I thought dominoes or like maybe like Mahjong or something. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like very advanced kind of card strategy strategy mixed with a little bit of gambling mm -hmm. and so she she's like a phenomenal bite and sting player and she's very very rarely beaten except she plays with Aaron and she ends up losing mm -hmm. like it's a close game and so uh their kind of terms on this game is like she would give him house privileges uh to like kind of roam freely around the courtyard go into town if he needs to and uh he she or they would be honest with each other like they would ask questions and kind of mm -hmm. have this more like informal relationship because i think that's what kestrel asked for in exchange is like because she's kind of awkward and like on the outskirts of society and just as her one friend but she knows that she kind of embarrasses just sometimes mm -hmm. and so i think she realizes that aaron is catching on more than he seems to and he's like you know probably was an aristocrat and like you know, before the takeover. 
And so she kind of asked for his honesty and like his opinion on things that they see together. And I think that's what she's asking for in exchange of like, okay, you can like go wonder, but like I kind of need a friend almost. Um, but there's this one quote. Uh, it's going back a little bit, but Aaron is walking around like at night and Kestrel always plays the piano like constantly. And it's at night when, you know, all of his duties are done or whatever. And the quote, so night had truly fallen. Aaron wondered if she would lift her eyes, but wasn't worried he would be seen in the garden shadows. He knew the law of such things. People in brightly lit places cannot see into the dark. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this author, <laughs> like, there are so many quotable lines in this oh, book. Oh, yeah. They're just brilliantly I have po- boost I just, like, my <laughs> like, it's just... Because <sighs> it's like, there's this longing in it, almost, of, like, he's, you know, he understands that he doesn't like her, but there's this, like, look at me. But it's like, it's dark out. She can't see anything. But he's like, look, like, bring up your eyes. Like, I'm looking at you. And that, <gasps> oh, that is a pattern that happens throughout the books. But also, I think why this story works as well as it does is because not only do you have external conflict driven by other, like, secondary characters and other, like, broad country level movements, you have so much internal conflict yeah. because Aaron's like, this is a slave owner. She has ruined my people, taken over my country. But... I love her music and she's delicate and small and I want to protect her, but I hate myself for wanting that. Like the internal conflict between like in him and in Kestrel. Yeah. Oh, I know. Uh. <laughs> Cause there's like the interpersonal and then there's the like moral <gasps> reason. I know girls too. <laughs> I can't even talk coherently about this book because I get too like yeah, into it. <laughs> it's hard and be- because there's so many different layers. I think that like the last kind of like plot device that we can kind of wrap up in mm-hmm. like this first part of talking about mm-hmm. the winner's curse is Lady is it Ferris. Her- Ferris's baby. Her love child. Ooh. Mm-hmm. So Kestrel and Jess and Aaron, uh, as their escort, go to this garden party, basically. And so Lady Ferris, her husband is away and she has a new baby. And everybody knows that this baby is not the husband's baby. I think Kestrel even says he's too cute. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But everyone's kind of shunning the baby a little bit. Mm -hmm. And like Lady Ferris is known for kind of being a bit of a player. Yeah. And it's like kind of wink wink nudge nudge it's not as um, overtly bad. It's Mm -hmm. just kind of like look the other way kind of thing because you're still like procreating for the empire yeah and her husband is like a well-to-do kind of senator so everybody's trying to get in his good graces yeah so no one's gonna be fucking around with that Mm -hmm. and so kestrel is like looking at this child and she's the only one who's like picks a flower and offers it to the baby and is Mm kind of like playing with him a little bit Mm -hmm. i was picturing your little guy a little Uh, bit like so cute (laughs) and Kestrel's like looking at Lady Ferris and looking at this baby and looking around like huh i wonder who the dad could be Mm -hmm. interesting Very interesting. Because it's fun, too, because I think the scene starts, she's playing a game of bite and sting with three other people. It's like Ronan, some other guy who's like their friend that doesn't really matter. He dies. Um, And then this guy, Irix, who ends up being the baby's father. And that's who she kind of like makes the like, they kind of share some features. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stick that in my pocket for later. But she, during this bite and sting, she kind of like embarrasses him with like how stupid he was and how well she was playing and like oh you should you know like bet more and she's kind of like baiting him and he's one of those doesn't take well to it no and i think like later he even like stops her and she's like walking out in a grove or something and he kind of like makes a pass at her oh and she has to like like disarm him or something yeah like 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 defend herself yeah and she doesn't do it very well and then she realizes Aaron's watching yeah. it. And like he's Aaron's very stoic about watching uh-huh. it. Like he doesn't react. And Kestrel's a little embarrassed by it. Yeah. She's like, she's a bit smaller. Like she's mm-hmm. not a good fighter. I thought they did a very good job of describing Kestrel as like a competent fighter because yeah. that is an expectation of everybody in their society. Mm-hmm. She's just not great at it. Yeah. So she can beat the average Joe. Like mm-hmm. she could probably beat the shit out of the two of us. Oh, yeah. 100%. But like <laughs> against like somebody like Eric's who is known for being a great fighter. Yeah. Like she ain't got shit. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And it's fun, too, because they're in the carriage, like, leaving the um, tea party, garden party or whatever. And Aaron even says, like, he's an ass. And Kestrel's, like, caught off guard that, like, oh, shit, like, he's noticing things more so. And it's this, like, smart moment of, like, minds meeting. Yeah. It's like, okay, you and see the undercurrents. Kestrel gets, like, a little, like, oh, he's, like, on my side a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, that's, the like, the first nigglings of, like, back and forth between Aaron and Kestrel. Mm-hmm. And it's fun, too, because you hear about this baby and you're like, why does this keep getting like because it gets brought up like twice. 
and you're like, okay, cool. Like, why is that important to the plot? And then it comes back later. It so very keep it in. much does. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget about the cute baby. Uh huh. Keep it in your pocket. Yep. So that is part one of the winner's curse. Yes. And from our shelf to yours. We'll see you on the next page. Hi, readers. If you'd like to help us pick our next book, send us a message on Instagram. Or if you'd like to just listen, we post new episodes every Monday and Wednesday on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon. Thanks for listening. Bussin'. <laughs>